Math 13, 14, Common Junior College, Section 1.5, Quadratic Equations, Video 1 of 10. Yes, that's a lot more videos than the previous series, because there's a lot to be said in this section. So we're going to solve quadratic equations, and I've already got some examples set up, but I would be remiss if I didn't actually tell you what a quadratic equation was. So I'm going to write the definition. And then I'll erase it because it's going to be in the way. Excuse me. So what is a quadratic equation? A quadratic equation is any equation equivalent to ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. Now what I mean by equivalent is it may be in this form already or with some algebraic manipulation we can make it look like this form. You'll notice that the two examples on the board already are of this form. Some number times x squared plus some number times x plus some number equals zero. And when I say plus you have to take that loosely because the a, the b, and the c can be positive or negative numbers. And speaking of the A, the B, and the C, specifically, the A cannot equal zero. Well, it could, but if it were, then this first term would disappear and it would no longer be categorized as a quadratic equation. I guess you could say that a quadratic equation is a polynomial equation of degree two. In other words, the highest power of the variable is two. If it were just one, it would be called a linear equation. So we're going to be solving quadratic equations, and I know of at least four ways to solve them. There are some more creative ways that sometimes are better options, but let's not go overboard. The first way that we're going to learn how to solve quadratic equations is by factoring. Now, if you are rusty on your factoring skills, skills which I must admit are a prerequisite for taking this class, then you need to review some factoring. Now, I know that not everybody remembers what they're supposed to coming into a college algebra class, factoring being one of the biggest things. So if you need a review of factoring, there is a series of videos about, well, reviewing factoring. So I will link those videos both in this uh, YouTube video's description and also in the Canvas shell for this class for you to watch as you feel necessary. That being said, as I go through these examples, I'm going to assume that you're either already capable of factoring, or if not, you will review factoring by watching the series of videos I've created for them. So how do we solve an equation by factoring? Well, we have to take advantage of something called the zero product principle. And to illustrate the zero product principle, I'm going to write a couple of numbers on my hands. I'm going to step over here so you can't see what they are. Uh, let's see. Let's do this number. And let's do this number. Okay. Now, I'm not going to tell you the two numbers I wrote on my hand. Okay? I'll show them to you in a minute. But I'll tell you something about them, and I want to see if you can guess what the numbers are. The two numbers on my hand, when I multiply them, I get six. So, what numbers could be on my hand? Two times three? They could, except neither one is two nor three. So what else could they be if the product is six? Well, if it's not two times three, then it must be one times six, right? Well, no. So it's not two and three, it's not one and six. And at this point, you might be scratching your head thinking, well, what else could they be? It's just one times two and, excuse me, one times six and two times three. But what if I told you you're limiting yourself to the types of numbers that I could have written on my hands? Two and three, one and six, those are all counting numbers. They're whole numbers also. They're, they're also other types of numbers. Go watch the first video in the series for section 1.4, Complex Numbers, if you've forgotten your different types of numbers. But if you're limiting yourself to positive whole numbers, you're never going to guess these. Oh, he said positive. Maybe he used negative numbers. Okay, okay. Negative 2 times negative 3. Good guess. Wrong. Oh, then negative 1 and negative 6. There you go. Still wrong. Oh, jeez. If it's not 1 and 6 or 2 and 3, 
or negative one and negative six or negative two and negative three, what's left? Again, if you can't think of any other numbers whose product is six, you're limiting your thinking to integers. There are more numbers than that. There are rational numbers, AKA fractions. And the minute I let those in the door, good luck guessing, because now there's an infinite number of pairs of numbers whose product is six. You could say one half times 12, one third times 18. You could get creative and say something like, uh, let's see, 12 fifths times five halves. Yeah, that would work. But there's so many fractions whose product is equal to six, you'll never guess that they were negative one third and negative 18. So what's my point? My point is when you multiply two numbers and the product is six, you have no guarantee what those numbers are. Because no matter what two numbers you say, I can always say no. And there will always be another product that works. So there are no guarantees when you multiply two numbers and the product is six. So we're gonna play the game one more time. But I'm gonna change the six to a different number. Let me write the numbers on my hands. Hold on. Okay. All right. Two numbers on my hands, I will tell you their product, and my question is, do you know what the numbers are? This time the product of the two numbers on my hands are, or is, zero. Different game now. Do you know what both numbers are? You probably don't, but I bet you know at least one of them. Because what's the only way you can multiply and get zero? The only way you can multiply two numbers and get a product of zero is if one of the numbers is zero. Oops, wrong number, that's pi, zero. So unlike six, whose product guarantees nothing, a product of zero guarantees that one of your two factors is zero, possibly both of them. So zero comes with a guarantee when it comes to multiplication. Everybody knows that if you multiply by zero, you get zero. But what a lot of people don't pause to think about is, that's the only way you can get zero, is by multiplying by zero. In fact, that product, that property is so important, it has its own name, it is called the zero product principle. I have seen this under many names. Zero product principle, zero product property, zero factor principle, zero factor property. Uh, in abstract algebra, it gets into the realm of zero divisors, but let's not go there. So what is the zero product principle? Well, it basically says what we just said. If you multiply two things and get zero, then one or both of those things must be zero. Algebraically, it looks like this. If you have a product equal to zero, symbol you might not be familiar with. It's a double-lined arrow. It is a symbol for the word implies. So if a product is equal to zero, that implies that the first factor is zero, or the second factor is zero, or both. Because they might both be zero. And again, in English, it basically says if you multiply and get zero, then one of the numbers you started with had to be zero. So how can we use that to our advantage? Well, the biggest obstacle in solving something like x squared plus 13x plus 30 equals zero is too many different x terms. Normally when you solve an equation, you get x by itself, but we have two incompatible x terms. They're not like terms. I can't combine them. I can't just move one to the other side and start solving because the other one gets trapped inside of whatever I solve for. So our biggest obstacle right now is that we have too many x's, specifically these two x's glued together. So how can we work around that? Well, if we can get a product equal to zero, the zero product principle says that we can set each factor equal to zero. So watch what happens if we take this trinomial and factor it. Now, here comes the factoring skills I was alluding to, skills that in theory you already have coming into a college algebra class, but in reality, a lot of people don't. If you need to review factoring, please watch the series of videos reviewing factoring. It will, be, it will shed all the details on all the factoring te techniques you will see in this video and the next one. So what does x squared plus 13x plus 30 factor into? 
Well, if you were to unfoil it, it would factor into x plus 3 and x plus 10. The short reason why, 3 plus 10 had a sum of 13, but 3 times 10 has a product of 30. Foil it out if you need convincing. But if you get it factored, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you write x plus 3 first and x plus 10 second, or vice versa, as long as you have the correct factors. But now that we have a product equal to zero, the zero product principle says we can basically split this into two separate equations. We can say, all right, this multiplication problem is equal to zero, so the first factor is equal to zero, or the second factor is equal to zero. And if you'll notice, that separates the x's, and now we can solve for each one. Solve for the first equation by subtracting three on both sides, you get x equals three. Solve the second equation by subtracting 10 from both sides, you get x equals negative 10. So we have two solutions, 3, negative 10. Now, if you are watching this video and using an online homework platform, and I'm speaking specifically to my class that these videos are made for, but anybody is welcome to watch. When you put these answers in your homework, it will say to separate them by a comma. So you would just type 3 comma negative 10. You would not type the x equals. As we do these problems, I want to, I want to build a list titled how to solve by factoring. And in fact, with this one example, we can kind of already start filling in some of these steps. I'm going to leave the first step blank because we haven't illustrated it yet. But the second step is to factor completely. Right now, factoring completely basically means factor once. But as we progress through this course, factor completely will involve multiple consecutive factoring moves. But once we factor it, your third step is to set each factor equal to zero, which is what the zero product principle says we can do. And then fourth and finally, solve each smaller equation. I invite you to pause the video and try the next example. I will warn you that the factoring is a little bit more involved because the leading coefficient, the number in front of the highest power, is not one. That kind of changes the foil game. There is a process for factoring this. Again, if you need some guidance, I strongly recommend watching the video series I've recorded about factoring techniques. So I invite you to pause the video and see if you can solve this one. All right, either you paused and tried it, or you didn't, and you're waiting for me. But either way, here it goes. First, we need to factor this trinomial. Tri meaning three terms. It will factor into 2x minus 3 and x minus 4. Why? Watch my videos on reviewing factoring. But if you wanted to check it, foil it out, and you'll see that it works. And again, the presence of this 2 in front kind of changes how you approach it. Here with the 1 in front, it was easy. The two numbers that add to give 13 but multiply to give 30 were what we needed. But if you notice, these two numbers, although they do multiply to give 12, they do not add to give negative 11. That's because this 2 up front goes a monkey wrench into all that. But let's say you get it factored. Then you're on easy street. Just set each factor equal to 0. 2x minus 3 equals 0. x minus 4 equals 0 and then continue to solve. For the second one, add 4 to both sides, and you get x equals 4. By the way, this type of move is a prerequisite skill I expect you to already have. And frankly, I expect you to be able to solve this in your head. And this one, can you solve this one in your head? Give it a try if you haven't already. What would I do first? What would I do next? First, you would add 3 to both sides to cancel the minus 3. 0 plus 3 is 3. And then you would try to divide both sides by 2. And notice I said try, because 3 doesn't like to divide by 2. Sure, you could get 1.5, but don't. Unless the problem specifically asks for decimals, don't give it decimals. Only give it whole numbers, integers, or rational numbers, aka fractions. All right. So solving equations, quadratic equations by factoring is pretty straightforward. What's this first step? And why did I almost not say quadratic? Let me answer the second question. This technique works for bigger equations. 
a story we will revisit many times between now and the end. But what's this first step? Well, watch video two and you'll see.